science fiction frequently tries to imagine what life would be like on a plane as far above us as we are above savagery. Its setting is often of a kind that appears to us as technologically miraculous. It is thus a mode of romance with a strong inherent tendency to myth. In setting out on his subversive undertaking to highlight the inadequacies of science fiction literature, and especially the nature of its protagonists emerging from the Campbellian publications, Frank Herbert turned to earlier modes of science fiction literature for inspiration. In the likes of H. G. Wells, Jules Verne and Samuel Butler, he found science fiction that had all the hallmarks of proper refined literature. Frank Herbert initially did not want to write science fiction, seeing it as a genre that was viewed by the critical establishment as being in the gutter. This was a viewpoint held by a number of non-genre authors when their works were primarily associated with science fiction, most notably by the likes of Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Paradoxically, in setting out to return science fiction to a more literary mode, and in his deliberate iconoclasm towards the typical protagonists of the genre, Frank himself had a leaning towards keeping science fiction in the gutter where it belongs. In looking backwards to the fiction of the scientific romances and late Victorian utopias, Herbert was able to garner a proper set of literary sensibilities about him. In particular, his extrapolation of themes and ideas from Samuel Butler's Erewhon would provide him with a visionary background for his masterpiece Dune and its following two books. In conceiving the Dune series from the outset as a trilogy, and setting out to undermine the Superman and Ubermensch that were prolifically populating science fiction stories, the viewpoints of Victorian science fiction towards evolution would provide a range of ideas and speculations which would help him create his great protagonists, the anti-messiah Paul Moadi Betrides, and his son, Leto II, the tyrannical god emperor. The first of the two major themes in the original Dune series is an examination of the nature of heroes and their role in society. In particular of concern to the Dune series is specifically the hero who becomes a larger than life messianic figure and follows what Frank Herbert liked to call the Camelot pattern. In addition to this, Herbert also wanted to examine society's role in creating such an individual and how their followers develop corresponding systems of power and control around their heroes ultimately destroying them. Such a hero has an enormous morphological impact upon civilization, and in being presented as a messiah, can permeate into various levels of such a society whether it is religiously, politically or economically. It is through whichever platform that they use to eventually arise to power, usually politics, war or religion that provides us with Herbert's interest in linking this concept to that of the other major thematic presentation in the books, namely that of ecology. I will discuss the role of ecology in the Dune series in the following chapter. It is sufficient for the purposes of understanding here to say that Frank Herbert believed that the next great platform for such a catastrophic superhero or messiah to use and manipulate would be that of ecology. From the 1960s onwards, with growing concerns regarding the environment, the ecological bandwagon could become a new and obvious target for the right sort of demagogue to launch their career and garner mass public approval. To the degree where such an individual could guide society unquestioningly down a particular path that would ultimately be disastrous. The green issue as we see today is prevalent in party politics and the cult of personality in popular culture. Herbert believed that heroes were bad for society, and if this was indeed the case, then superheroes, those who the general public elevates above the status of mere mortals, can have devastating consequences. His views on this were particularly shaped by what he liked to call the Camelot pattern, and often cited the likes of Adolf Hitler, John F. Kennedy, and General George Patton as prime examples. While focusing on this Camelot pattern and how it is presented by the major protagonists in Dune via a number of different methods, especially by Paul Atreides and his son Leto II, I will also examine the development of the hero in the science fiction literature of the Golden Age and early post-war period. 
This will focus on the use of classical archetypes from mythology, epics and saga literature, by Herbert, and his attempt to subvert the typical ubermensch that started to dominate the genre in the early 40s and 50s, especially in the form of what is known as the Van Vautian hero. In discussing the origins of Dune, Herbert often cites his theories of the disastrous hero with his notions of ecology based upon the article he was to write on sand dune encroachment and control in Oregon. Here he discusses the beginnings of his heroic concept for Dune. How did it begin? I conceived of a long novel, the whole trilogy as one book about the messianic convulsions that periodically overtake us. Demagogues, fanatics, con game artists, the innocent and the not so innocent bystanders, all were to have a part in the drama. This grows from my theory that superheroes are disastrous for humankind, that even if we find a real hero, whatever that may be, eventually fallible mortals take over the power structure that always comes into being around such a leader. The first concept that Herbert began to flesh out was that of the messianic impulse that periodically overtakes the masses and the danger of the hero or superhero to human society. Before going further and looking at Herbert's own attitudes towards these heroes, it would be prudent to first discuss what exactly we mean by the terms hero, superhero and messiah. The word hero comes from the original Greek heros, which traditionally meant simply a type of gentleman or nobleman, sometimes a king, and who had the right to meet and dole laws and justice. The term's meaning has changed little over the years, but the typical protagonists of Greek mythology and what we call the heroic age, often in addition to their noble status, had some extraordinary ability which made them truly stand out as an iconic individual, and sometimes as a person whose fame merited worship. As Simon Goldhill points out when examining Oedipus in Oedipus at Colonus, the association of cultural ritual in the play and its effect upon its audience is akin to religious reaffirmation of an old Greek tragic hero on a later society. Oedipus and his transformation from blind exile to superhuman hero, a figure honoured with offerings by the Athenians at Colonus, mobilises the powerful religious feelings of hero cult. The extraordinary abilities that set these heroes apart from mere mortal men are often varied, sometimes inherited through divine heritage or favour. Thus, Heracles had his great strength, Achilles his skill in war, Theseus his intelligence, and Odysseus his deceptive cunning and wit. But to Cedric Whitman, this view of the hero is only part of their appeal and inspiration. It is the association that we have with such men, that aspect we can recognise in ourselves, that allows us to admire, worship and lay claim to such iconic individuals. The Greek heroic notion involves far more than mere exaggerated physical prowess. It involves somehow the totality of the human individual, writ large of course, but still representative of humanity in its individual consciousness. Therefore the possession of physical or mental prowess coupled with outstanding achievements and the admiration of society are implicit in our understanding of the heroic ideal. Even in the Oxford English Dictionary we have the following definition of the word hero. 1. A person, typically a man, who is admired for their courage or outstanding achievements. In mythology and folklore, a person of superhuman qualities, in particular one of those whose exploits were the subject of ancient Greek legends. 2. The chief male character in a book, play or film. However, Dean M. Miller presents us with an insight into the term which has a certain resonance with Frank Herbert's concept of the hero. In discussing the perplexity at what the Greeks and Romans thought of as heroes, Miller isolates a key phrase of Joseph Fontenrose's, namely that these heroes were seen as powerful ghosts. This view of the hero, as Miller suggests, highlights two key concepts of heroic nature, namely that they are an intermediary power and have a fundamental association with death. In being an intermediary, and through their association with death, the hero stands apart from both humanity and the divine, yet at one and the same time is congruent to both worlds. 
In that sense, the hero has the ability to influence both real and imagined worlds, and after death or apotheosis, or both, can continue to exude such an influence upon human society. In keeping with Frank Herbert's concept of the dangerous hero, Miller states, the fact that the hero's intermediary power may in fact be something not to seek out or welcome, but to fear. As we shall see, both Paul Moadi Betraides and his son Leto II's intermediary powers, such as prescience and other memory, are indeed something for humanity to fear, their influences extending back into the real world from beyond the grave. This is carried on through their roles as both the semi-divine, Paul as prophet, and divinity, Leto II as a living god. Paul is a messiah and prophet to the Fremen, the one they call the Lisan al Gaib, or Mahdi. Paul's association with Western, Arabic, and esoteric religious icons is well realised in the Dune series. The mingling of religious ideals and icons is associative with the CET's merging of religions following the Butlerian Jihad. The name Paul is resonant with Christianity's apostle, St Paul of Tarsus, while he is also associated with the Jewish Messiah and the Islamic Mahdi and Lisan al Ghaib. The Oxford Dictionary of Phrase and Fable provides us with a useful definition for the term Messiah. The promised deliverer of the Jewish nation prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus regarded by Christians as the Messiah of the Hebrew prophecies and the Saviour of humankind. Recorded from Old English in the form Messias, the name comes via Late Latin and Greek from Hebrew Masia, anointed. From the mid 17th century, the word has developed a transferred use to denote an expected liberator or saviour of an oppressed people, country, or cause. Paul then is seen as a saviour to the Fremen, one who will deliver them from the harshness of life upon Arrakis and who will lead them into a new age, where the world of Dune itself will be transformed from a barren desert world into an Eden-like paradise. The Fremen themselves in Dune are based on a blending of cultures, specifically Sunni Islam, Sufism, the Bedouin, and also include elements of Judaism and Zen Buddhism. As a messiah, we can take this term to be from both the Hebrew sense of a prophesied and promised deliverer of a people, as well as in the more eclectic sense of a liberator or saviour of a repressed people. Similarly, there is also a useful definition for the term Mahdi in the Oxford Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. In popular Muslim belief, a spiritual and temporal leader who will rule before the end of the world and restore religion and justice. Not part of orthodox doctrine, the concept of such a figure was introduced into popular Islam through Sufi channels influenced by Christian doctrine. Notable among those claiming to be this leader was Muhammad Ahmad of Dongola in Sudan, whose revolutionary movement captured Khartoum and overthrew the Egyptian regime. As is often the case, there have been many people throughout history that have claimed to be the Mahdi, just as there have been many who have claimed to be reincarnations of Jesus Christ or Buddha. Again what is important here is the use of a term from yet another culture or religion which we see applied to Paul Atreides in Dune. This is notable as we will see when we view how Herbert approached the idea of his messianic hero, especially through the eclectic mythography and iconotropy that he studied. What is clear is that he is identifying messianic tropes or mythemes from various cultures to add to the mystique of the Kwisatz Satirach his particular take on the superhuman hero. The Fremen also refer to Paul as the Lisan al Gib, a phrase which Herbert translates as the voice from the outer world and giver of water. Khalid M. Bahaildin, in his work on the etymology of Arabic and Islamic terms in Dune, points out that Lisan means tongue or speaker and Gaib means unknown or things that will come in the future unknown to us now. He also notes that this concept is one of the basic tenets of the Muslim faith, is the belief that God alone knows what is hidden in the future. Again showing us Herbert's intent on identifying Paul Atreides with the divine or semi-divine. 
One of Paul's first acts in joining the Fremen is to kill Jamis in a ritual fight to the death. After this occurs, a transition point for the young protagonist, he is given an adopted name by the Fremen, as well as being asked to choose a troop name for himself, which only those of Siege Tabar may use. The Fremen name Paul is given at this point is Usul, which Stilgar tells him means the base of the pillar. Bahilden points out that the Arabic root Asl means base. Usul is the plural and is used for basis, principles, methods. The troop name Paul chooses for himself is Muadib, after the small kangaroo mouse of Arrakis that is admired for its ability as a good survivor in the desert. In June, Muadib the kangaroo mouse is associated with Fremen Earth spirit mythology with a design visible on the planet's second moon. Stilgar informs Paul that the Fremen call this little creature Instructor of Boys. Again, Bahilden points out that there is an almost exact word in Arabic like it, Muadi, which means private tutor or teacher. Another appellation for Paul in June is the Kwisatz Saderach, which roughly translated means shortening of the way, and is also suggestive of the term the one who can be many places at once. Kwisatz Saderach is probably best compared with the English phrase shortcut, although this would really be a misnomer. In fact it is virtually identical to the term bilocation and its association with various Christian saints and holy men. Examples of bilocation occur with such notable religious personalities as St Pio of Pietrelchina and Maria de Jesus de Agreda. Kwisatz Haderach is a derivative from the original Hebrew Kefitzatz Haaretz, which means those for whom the earth jumped. Where this occurs in the Torah, it is descriptive of a form of miracle where an individual who is needed far away finds himself suddenly teleported to the specific location in question. Herbert's use of the term probably came from a Hasidic phrase adapted from the Kefitzat Haaretz, namely the Kefitzat Haderek. Variations include Kefitzat Haderek and Kefitzat Haderek. This was essentially an ideological explanation for how a Balai Shem, a type of mystic in certain stories, was able to travel great distances very quickly, akin almost to the power of teleportation. Paul as the hero has a degree of mystique built up around him as he has several names with different meanings and religious connotations attached to them. All of these names carry cultural and religious contexts and meanings to the discerning reader that represent a combining of humanity's dominant religious belief systems. Religious association then is widespread and multicultural with Paul Atreides as a character, and is also important within the Dune series as well, especially with regard to the Imperium's hybrid orange Catholic Bible and the Fremen's Zen Sunni faith. As Thomas Carlyle points out in his study of the hero as divinity, it is well said, in every sense, that a man's religion is the chief fact with regard to him, and that, of a man or of a nation we inquire, therefore, first of all, what religion they had. To that end the second appendix of Dune is entitled The Religion of Dune, and explains much of the faiths and belief systems developed after the Butlerian Jihad, and therefore the religious and cultural factors which allow Paul to become a prophet of the Fremen. Kwisatz Haderach is the term that Frank Herbert applies to his concept of a superhuman, an evolutionary shortcut created by the Bene Gesserit breeding program. It also applies to some other characters in the Dune series, but ultimately we should consider its use with Paul, Leto II, and later with Duncan Idaho. In that sense we can look at them from the viewpoint of the hero as prophet, hero as divinity, and hero as mortal, each of which attains a divine or semi-divine status, religious following, mysterious death, and ultimately apotheosis. Aside from the messianic complex, the superhero therefore is simply someone whose powers and abilities go above and beyond those of a hero who is someone already endowed with talents beyond those of normal men. It is important to understand that Frank Herbert is talking about those individuals in society 
whose talents are perceived to be beyond those of the normal masses, ultimately leading to a form of hero worship. The population who idolises such an individual and grants them access to power ultimately hands over most of their decision making processes to such a hero. This in turn allows this superhero to make mistakes on a much grander scale than any given normal individual would. Herbert's attitude, especially towards the superhero, was based on what I believe can clearly be seen as three distinct concepts. The first of these is the hero based on contemporary historical, military, political and religious figures. The second concept of the dangerous hero was exemplary in the emerging tradition of the protagonist as represented in science fiction literature of the time, in particular that of the golden age of science fiction which is generally identified as that period of science fiction that flourished under the editorial leadership of John W. Campbell. The third and final view of the hero is that of the classical and mythical heroic archetype, in particular based upon the works of Lord Raglan, Joseph Campbell and Carl Gustav Jung, and usually albeit incorrectly portrayed as a ubiquitous model based on the western heroic traditions presented in myths, legends, epics and sagas. Such ubiquitous models are apparent in works such as The Concept of the Monomyth by Campbell and Lord Raglan's step by step guide to the mythical hero as portrayed in drama and ritual. The germination of this perspective towards messianic heroes and superheroes can be found in Herbert's relationship with close family friends Irene Slattery and her husband Dr Ralph Slattery. In the biography of his father, Dreamer of Dune, Brian Herbert discusses Frank's relationship with Irene and Ralph, which emerged out of his interest in the works of the psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung. Frank got to know the Slattery family after attending a talk in a church in Santa Rosa given by Irene herself. Frank and his wife Beverly sat next to Ralph in the audience and they became fast friends. Frank's continuing interest in Jungian psychology was spurred on by Irene Slattery, who had in fact been a student of Jung in the 1930s in Germany. During this time she had seen Adolf Hitler speak to the German people and was very frightened by what she saw and heard. Hitler terrified her from the moment she first gazed upon him. He was a skillful demagogue, she said, an expert at couching twisted, angry thoughts in words that sounded convincing. He was a hero to the German people, and terribly dangerous in that position, she felt, because of the way his people followed him slavishly, without questioning him, without thinking for themselves. Irene Slattery had related this experience to Frank Herbert years after the event, and according to Brian Herbert, this was the spark that ignited his father's interest in this theme of the disastrous superhero. This can be regarded in the context of the first of the three concepts pertaining to the hero that are presented in Dune. Her thoughts about the danger of heroes simmered in Dad's highly receptive brain and ultimately would form a cornerstone of the Dune series. Heroes are dangerous, especially when people follow them slavishly, treating them like gods. Despite this obvious example of how a so called hero whose abilities to entrance a population into blind obedience or obsequious adoration, Hitler was not the only example of a leader whose influence was catastrophic for the people that followed him, and Herbert would often cite the likes of Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt. But the two leaders he most often referred to in terms of the Camelot pattern were the examples of John F. Kennedy and General George Patton. My favourite examples are John F. Kennedy and George Patton. Both fitted themselves into the flamboyant Camelot pattern, consciously assuming bigger than life appearance. But the most casual observation reveals that neither was bigger than life. Each had our common ailment, clay feet. This then was one of my themes. Don't give over all of your critical faculties to people in power, no matter how admirable those people may appear. So the fallibility of the hero, Fundamentally tied to the inherent systems of power was an ultimately destructive force for society from Frank Herbert's perspective. But the nature of the hero in itself was not enough alone to be the impetus for this disastrous impact. Heroes have followers, and it is in June that the reader becomes complicit in these messianic convulsions that have taken over the Fremen 
just as in real life the likes of Kennedy, Hitler and Patton would ultimately remain a great deal less powerful without the en masse adoring followers that they maintain. This complicity on the reader's part comes from our conscious support of the novel's protagonist, who is both sympathetic and intriguing. Everything that affects Paul in June is not just part of the heroic process, but designed to garner our sympathy for the hero. His initial innocence, the tragedy of the fall of his father's house, and the grotesque villainy of the Harkonnen all serve to garner our sympathy for Paul. It is only with the inversion of themes that begin in Dune Messiah that we realise to our horror what this hero has done. What is even worse is the justification for his genocidal jihad that on many levels the reader can find not only understandable, but even justifiable. The second concept of the hero that Dune explores and at the same time undermines is that presented by the development of contemporary science fiction. Science fiction had two real traditions of the hero. The first of these traditions is what John Clute and Peter Nichols refer to in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction as the Edisonian model, a term taken from the name of the famous inventor Thomas Edison. The Edisonian model refers to an archetypal hero who is essentially an American, male, and is either an inventor or scientist by occupation, and who often uses his scientific knowledge or technical skill at invention to get him out of a particularly tight spot. As used here, the term Edisonade, derived from Thomas Alva Edison in the same way that Robinsonade is derived from Robinson Crusoe, can be understood to describe any story which features a young US male inventor hero who uses ingenuity to extricate himself from tight spots and who, by doing so, saves himself from defeat and corruption and his friends and nation from foreign oppressors. The invention by which he typically accomplishes this feat is not, however, simply a weapon, though it will almost certainly prove to be invincible against the foe and may also make the hero's fortune. It is also a means of transportation, for the Edison aid is not only about saving the country or planet through personal spunk and native wit, it is also about lighting out for territory. The Edisonian hero as discussed above is a particular science fiction take on the concept of the Robinsonian hero taken from Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. The term was coined because of the influence Defoe's work had, creating and influencing a literary genre all of its own, often identifiable by the dislocation and separation of the protagonists from everyday life and civilization. A number of science fiction works also fall into the category of Robinsonades, including the likes of William Golding's The Lord of the Flies, Robert A. Heinlein's Tunnel in the Sky, and Tom Godwin's The Survivors, to name but a few. Thomas Edison himself was also notably such a protagonist. In Garrett P. Service's Edison's Conquest of Mars, the Edisonade hero, however, bears little resemblance in reality to the Robinsonade despite the genres crossing over now and then. This occurs really for the simple reason that science fiction is capable of blending and mixing with just about any other genre. The Edisonade's original archetype owes more to the Cretan inventor Daedalus from Greek mythology, and who can be seen as the original inventor hero. Developing out of the tradition of the Edisonade is another kind of hero, one who would later subvert the Edisonade to the status of a heroic companion or sidekick. This type of hero is more focused towards action, and is often a young athletic male who has become entangled in whatever convoluted scientific plot presents itself, and resolves the peril and calamities he is involved in by scrapping his way through his problems with fists, laser guns, or spaceships. Probably two of the most famous of these early science fiction scrappers are without doubt the likes of Philip Francis Nolan's Buck Rogers, Edisonade companion being Dr. Heer, and Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon, Edisonade companion being Dr. Hans Zarkov. Buck Rogers first appeared in Amazing Stories as the novella Armageddon 24 19 AD, before making the move to become the first science fiction serial comic strip for the National Newspaper Service Syndicate. Flash Gordon was to later appear in 1934 to compete with the already established Buck Rogers. Over the next decade or so, 
the science fiction hero began to take on more and more of the attributes of the superhero, whose popularity was growing in the comic strip world since the appearance of Superman in the first edition of Action Comics. Despite these traditions of the hero common to science fiction, there was a new kind of hero that would begin to dominate the genre from the 40s onwards. Pushing aside the traditional science fiction heroes was the emergence of the Van Vautian hero, which began with Alfred Elton Van Vaught's novel Slan. The Van Vautian hero, Jommy Cross in Slan, was essentially an evolved ubermensch. This was a much more solitary type of hero, often alienated and isolated from society, race or nation, and bearing the attributes of a particular evolutionary advantage, or else some kind of super or psionic power. The Van Vautian hero owed a great deal to the development of superheroes, as well as some of the emerging and developing philosophies, such as Korzybski's General Semantics and L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. It can also be said that this kind of hero was exactly the kind of hero that John W. Campbell wanted as a protagonist in the stories he sought to publish at the time. Van Vaught used Korzybski's general semantics in some of his more famous works, such as the Null A novels, and was also a notable follower of Hubbard's Dianetics, though not so much with the subsequent Church of Scientology. It is not a far stretch of the imagination to see how ultimately this development in science fiction would soon take another leap along these lines towards messianic characters, and it was exactly this that Herbert sought to challenge with Dune. The deep irony of Dune's popular triumph and that of its many sequels is Herbert's declared intention to undermine exactly that besotted identification with Van Vautian's Superman hero. It is in this crux, as much as in the stylistic advances and excesses of the new wave, that the 60s made its mark on science fiction, and science fiction made its greater mark on the world. The third concept of the nature of the hero that especially interested Herbert was that of the classical archetype as had been discussed by the likes of Lord Raglan, Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung. Not only through the archetypes of the hero in myth, but especially the 22 steps that the hero follows according to Lord Raglan, and the concept of the monomyth developed by Campbell, form very much the framework of the trials and tribulations of Paul Atreides in June. <laughs> <laughs> 